Welcome back, everybody. Today, we have a great guest, Dr. Jose Antonio. He's an associate professor of health and human performance. He teaches classes in exercise physiology, sports supplements for athletic performance. And that's where we're actually going to be doing our podcast on today. So I can't wait. He's from NSU, Florida. You can find more about him uh, over at the nova.edu faculty human performance backslash Antonio dash Jose. He's also got another thing coming up here in the next few months. Um, it's, it's for the International Society of Sports Nutrition. We'll ask him a little bit more about that in a minute. But today's all about supplements. So who knows? Well, we talk about branched chain aminos. We'll talk about creatine, I'm sure, and a whole host of other things. Are they really all they're cracked up to be? Which ones are the good ones? Which ones are not? So we'll find out. Before we get started, make sure to share, subscribe, hit that like button. You know we like it. Let's not waste any more time. Welcome to the show, Dr. Antonio. Welcome, sir. Hey, thank you, Carlos. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. I'm looking out your window. You must be somewhere that is in Florida. That's for damn sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a virtual background. So, <laughs> <laughs> Where are you, actually? Uh, actually, in California. Oh, Cali. Okay. Well, yeah, so we're about the same thing. Both nice weather okay. <laughs> for Christmas. That's true. That's true. Hey, uh, let me ask you this. So for the folks out there listening right now, the International Society of Sports Nutrition, you said there's a conference coming up? Yes, our uh, 19th annual conference is June 16th to the 18th. It is uh, literally on the beach. It is at Fort Lauderdale Beach. So you walk out of the hotel, you cross A1A, beach is there. If you get bored with science, it's hard to get bored at the beach. You could always go there, hang out, then come back in, learn a little science. I mean, it's uh, you can't go wrong coming to Florida. I mean, there's uh, a lot of fun things to do. Absolutely. What a great place for sports nutrition can show off your abs and everything else. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's really, you know, what's interesting. I've been following this stuff for, oh, I don't know, how old am I now? It's about 30 something years and it keeps evolving. I dropped out of it a little bit for probably about a decade, I guess. I don't know if that's a little bit or not, but I dropped out of it focusing on it and it's so much has changed. I grew up more in the era I don't know how old you are. I'm 50, but I grew up in the era of EAS and Bill Phillips and muscle tech and hot stuff. If you remember hot stuff as well and all these you know, products. Yeah. Carlos, uh, I actually wrote for Bill Phillips magazine, muscle media, 2000. I don't even know if you remember yeah. that. Yeah. Um, your name does look familiar. Yeah. Muscle media, 2000. What's interesting. You're talking the early nineties. Um, the, the magazine and the brand, EAS as a brand, were it was exploding. And the Weeder publications were, uh, they felt threatened by it. Uh, but as you know, Bill Phelps sold EAS, Muscle Media 2000 disappeared. Um, but yeah, for a, for a period there, I was, in fact, I worked as a, a professional writer after I got my PhD. I didn't go straight in academia. I actually worked as a professional oh. writer for about two years. You know, I wrote for Muscle Media, wrote for all the Weeder publications. Um, so that's really how I got my start in the industry. Oh, how funny is that? That yeah. was a great time back then. I think bodybuilding, I mean, I think that's what the focus was mostly about. Body sculpting, I like to call it sometimes too, was really big back then. Today's kind of morphed into more of a CrossFit functional type of world that we live in now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, bodybuilding, I don't know if anyone actually, and this sounds odd. I don't know if anyone actually cares about bodybuilding much these days. I think uh, no, it doesn't. The male physiques, actually, even the female physiques have gotten so unrealistic that um, yeah, it doesn't really appeal to anyone in the mainstream anymore. And uh, you're right, CrossFit. I, what's interesting, you mentioned CrossFit. Nothing, there's not a single entity that has popularized weight training more than CrossFit, oddly enough. Now, you know, I've been one of those people who criticize the way they train because I always say, well, they're not really training for anything because it's sort of haphazard and all over the place. But hey, at the same time, you're working out. I mean, CrossFit for better or worse has gotten a lot of people to go into a gym, work out. I mean, maybe the, there's that community aspect. So people love that. Um, but it has introduced a lot of people to, you know, resistance training, which is something bodybuilding kind of did, but never to the extent that CrossFit did. And, and, and I'm not even a CrossFit fan, but hey, you know, you got to give them credit where credit's due. And they have phenomenal bodies. I mean, they really do. They, they look great, which is appealing to a lot of people too, right? Because people want to look, want to have those abs and those muscles and the, the tone's very good. And it's not unrealistic, as you mentioned a minute ago. Right. Yeah, you know, this is something that's attainable for a lot of individuals. It's interesting because I had a conversation with another guy. He has a really big podcast called Mind Pump. 
Um, and we were talking about social media influencers now in the sense of the world, fitness influencers, and how that can be a little dangerous because of the fact that these CrossFitters, you know, some of them are better than others, but some of them just show these exercises. And if you're not conditioned right, or if you haven't done anything for a long time, you can be a, a, a serious trouble. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, and also some of the exercises are actually quite advanced. I mean, yeah. teaching the masses how to do a clean and jerk and how to do a snatch, those are technical exercises. That's not, and in fact, for the average person who isn't a competitive weightlifter, I'm not even sure there's a value to teaching it because there's so much technique involved. And, you know, if you're just someone who wants to work out to get in shape, do you need to do snatches? Do you need to do cleans? I don't think so. But hey, if you want to learn it, that's great too, but just make sure you learn it properly because um, there's nothing worse than watching people do Olympic lifts and do it poorly. It's like, oh my God, I can't, it's cringe, cringy to watch these people, some of them lift. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to switch over to supplements now because I do see, I think that confuses sometimes folks too, and they get the missing mis representation of if you see six pack abs and then you see them holding a branch chain amino acid or some kind of fat loss supplement, they think it automatically that's probably what did it. Um, that becomes problematic. So I guess we'll, we'll start off with that. Um, I want to go back in history again for a minute and we'll see how it evolved over the years. Cause I know things have changed a lot since we, since your 1990s, as we were talking about yeah. earlier, muscle tech still seems to be around hanging tight. Um, I think EAS is gone now for, I don't know how many years they've been out. Yeah. yeah. You know, what's weird in the supplement industry. There's a, um, brands don't seem to last very long. It's like they go through this life cycle where they're super popular and then it's, it's almost inevitable. What happens to a brand that's super popular? Like, yeah, yes. It gets sold to a large corporation. What does the large corporation do? They kill it and they don't kill it on purpose. They just happen to kill it because they don't understand Oftentimes they don't understand the supplement industry. So to them, they treat it as if, you know, as if, you know, Nabisco bought another cracker, you know, brand or something or, or cookie brand. It's, it's supplements are a weird thing. And, and so when you look back to the landscape, go back to like the early 1990s, Weeder was still a brand that people bought. Uh, Metrics was an up and coming brand that became very popular as was EAS. Now Metrics, I mean, I haven't seen a Metrics product ever. Uh, EIS, you don't see that at all. So, and also because of the advent of the internet, now consumers have just a lot more choices. They can pick whatever they want. And I don't know if brand loyalty is, it doesn't exist like the way it may have existed, you know, two or three decades ago, uh, mainly because of choices. And also the God's honest truth is Amazon is taking over a lot of the supplement <laughs> industry. I mean, if you when a guy, you know, just go on Amazon, you get it, you get it the same day, which is like, wow, you get the same stuff, same day. Um, That's and true. consumers have access to all this information. I mean, you don't have to be brand loyal anymore. That's a great point. And by the way, uh, metrics bars, I still eat. <laughs> you do? Oh my. Wait, yeah. uh, do you eat those, those big, heavy bars? I forget what they're called. Uh, they weigh like, they're like a rock if you let them sit around. <laughs> yeah, they've improved those. It's still a big bar. It's a 40 gram protein bar or something like that. Uh, and maybe we can talk about that. I'll start off the show there. I'll put myself on the line. <laughs> <laughs> what about these bars that have a high protein? Is it still is it the same quality as you would get? I'm assuming it's not the same quality as you would get from steak or chicken or turkey, but do they provide anything else with all the aminos that are injected in there or whatever they do to it? You know, they're... Theoretically, there shouldn't be a difference if you're consuming a bar that has 40 grams of protein versus 40 grams of protein as, you know, beef, chicken, or fish. Um, because at the end of the day, nobody eats just bars and nobody eats just food, at least for most people who train. Um, so to me, it's just one meal out of many. I mean, if you eat three meals a day and one of them has to be a protein bar because you just, you just don't have time to eat a full meal, I think that's fine because, you know, when, you, when you're looking at diets that are typically mixed, I mean, you know, people, it's interesting, there, there's a large, a fairly vocal anti-supplement crowd that thinks, like certain athletes, all they do is eat supplements. It's like, well, no, they might take a supplement after they work out, but they're still eating meals. So when you're looking at the fact that people eat mixed meals throughout the day, having a bar or having a shake or whatever supplement it is, in the scheme of things, is it going to have that great an impact because you're doing all the other things? And, uh, and so to me, a bar is fine. 
protein. In fact, for me, the only time I have a shake is after I work out. I'll have a protein shake. Why? Because it's convenient. I, when I, you know, in South Florida, really almost all my training now is I, I go paddle. I do a lot of stand up paddling here in Florida. Oh. And after I paddle, like this morning, I paddled for about six, uh, about an hour and a half, not quite an hour and 10 minutes. I had a, you know, 42 gram shake and I, dro- I drank it as I drove home. And then, you know, two or three hours later, I had a regular meal. So it represents a convenient protein choice. And there's a lot to be said for convenience because, you know, I'll pay for convenience. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, after I work out, I'm not going to (laughs) go eat a piece of chicken. I'm I'm not even hungry. So, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because it's something I've noticed again in the last two decades that has changed a lot. I wish I had it back then when I was really training hard. Um, Things like Flex Pro or Factor 75 or Redcon 1 that have these prepackaged meals that already have all your calorie count for you and your protein grams. <laughs> I mean, that's awfully nice. Two minutes and boom, you got yourself your, your calorie count for the day and your macros. It's really amazing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I mean, hey, that, you know, the, the, the food technology has improved so much that you get all these prepackaged meals and they're not bad tasting. You know, I'm not a fan of them, but I know a lot of people are like, hey, I just buy a bunch and I'll you know, I'll eat one meal every day of the week and that, that, that serves its purpose. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, it forces me to eat the vegetables. So <laughs> <laughs> one way to do it. <laughs> so how about, let's go to some of the, the hot ones. I know people are going to be wondering about branch chain amino acids. Um, what's the story here? We have some people who say you don't need it. You'll get enough from food. Other people say you do need it. And the pre post workouts always still debated, I think from a lot of studies, but what's your take? Right. Uh, what's interesting about branch chain amino acids, and for the audience, if you're not familiar, it's 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 the three uh, amino acids: valine, leucine, and isoleucine. There's no supplement that probably gets as beat up in social media as branch chains. In fact, a lot of the PhDs I know they routinely go on social media. The branch chains are the biggest. The only thing that you'll 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 lo- the only thing that'll happen is your wallet will like weigh less or something, you know. And I always. <laughs> I always wonder if, if if these individuals ever put it in context. I mean, to say something's a complete waste, meaning to, the way I interpret that is it's a complete waste all the time. It never does anything ever. So that's how I interpret it. Because if it's a, a complete waste, it's a complete waste. It's and here's the thing: it's scientists are are notorious for this, as are bodybuilders. Almost every supplement is viewed from the from the prism of bodybuilding. It's like, well, does it make me bigger? Well, it doesn't really make me bigger. Oh, it's a waste of time. Okay. Well, you know, there are all these sports that have nothing to do with bodybuilding. I call them the run, bike, swim sports or the podium sports. You know, people actually race, you know, people race. <laughs> They're not always just trying to make their, you know, their left deltoid as big as the right deltoid. Um, for them, and this is where branch chains has a limited value, but a value nonetheless. There's plenty of data to show that branch chain amino acids can can decrease delayed onset muscle soreness. For athletes who perform a task, not bodybuilders, because it doesn't matter for bodybuilding because you're not performing anything. You're just trying to sculpt your physique. If you're an athlete, and it doesn't meet matter if you're professional, you could be recreational. Maybe you just want to run a 5K faster. I mean, there's a lot of people who, you know, what I call them recreational athletes. They have a goal, but they know they're not going to make money doing this because they're not good enough, but you can still have goals. Branch chain, there's plenty of data showing branch chain amino acids can decrease delayed onset muscle soreness. Why is that important? Well, for a lot of sports, being sore offers no benefit at all. Let's say you play, um, uh, let's say you play uh, baseball or softball. Let's take a college baseball or softball player. If you're sore, it affects how you throw the ball. It affects how you field the ball. It affects how you hit the ball. In a sport that requires skill, being sore has no value. Now, for a lot of people who do physique stuff, a lot of them feel like, hey, if I'm sore, I've gotten a good workout, et cetera, et cetera. Eh, you don't have to be sore to induce muscle hypertrophy, but hey, some people like it. You know, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. So do branch chain amino acids help you gain uh, lean body mass, <clears throat> excuse me, or skeletal muscle mass? Eh, no. Does it help you recover from exercise in that it might limit delayed onset muscle soreness? Yes. So if you sort of leave the physique stuff out, because people get so, it's really weird. It's even scientists do that. They focus so much on the physique stuff and they forget most people don't train that way. (laughs) Most people are not going into the gym 
bodybuilding. They might go in there to lift, but they're not bodybuilding. So why not have brand chain amino acids? People can take it to decrease the late onset muscle soreness. Now, now I'll, I'll, I'll argue what the next position is for the people who hate branch chains. And I'm indifferent to it. I don't take branch chains, but you know, I'll give you the facts. They'll say, well, why not just get protein? And my answer is, yeah, you can also get protein. They're not mutually <laughs> exclusive. If I want to drink a shake instead of take branch chains, I can. However, let's say you're a cyclist and on a weekend you do, you know, three to four hour bike rides. You're not going to drink a shake. Why not take branch chains? So there is a value to it depending on the circumstance, but it's, it's kind of annoying when everyone seems to view it through the prism of bodybuilding, when in fact bodybuilding is mean, technically, is it a competitive sport? Well, well, you're competing for something, but you're not doing anything. If that makes sense, you're just, you know, you're basically standing up there in your underwear is what you're doing. So you're not, you're not performing a task. So if you're performing a task, there might, you know, there could be value to uh, branch chains, uh, branch chain amino acids. What about for preventing muscle breakdowns? Usually, what you hear sometimes too, or uh, protein synthesis, or anything of that nature. Uh, any any value to that? Yeah, I mean, it does. There is data showing that branch chain amino acids have a limited value in in enhancing muscle protein synthesis. It's limited. Um, is it the best choice? Not really. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you have all these choices. Well, what do you want to do? And, you know, some people use branch chains. And to me, it's like, hey, that's fine, too. It's sort of like this. It's sort of arguing what's better for cardio, running, biking, or swimming. It's like, well, what do you like to do? I mean, technically, <laughs> you could argue running is better than swimming. I mean, that would, those, that, those two would probably be the biggest differences, you know, if you're trying to improve cardiovascular capacity. but if you hate running, don't run, you know, <laughs> swim, you know, so it's a lot of it is a personal preference. I don't think, I mean, there, there are all, there are supplements that are complete waste of time that do nothing, but the branch chain amino acids are not them. And also if you pull out one of the amino acids, leucine, I don't know if you follow, you know, people talk about leucine, how yeah. it's the, it's the trigger for muscle protein synthesis. Gotta have seven grams. I say. You know, typically it's like a two to three gram, you need to hit two to three grams per, per meal. But, um, but one of the downstream metabolites of leucine is HMB. And I don't know if you remember from the muscle media 2000, oh, yeah. that HMB that was, was huge. promoted by Bill Phillips. Right. It was, that was called, it was like DECA, you know, it's like, well, you know, that's bullshit of course. Um, but even with <laughs> HMB, and this is a digression, people said, well, HMB is a waste of time. Yeah. Well, HMB works as well as leucine. And people love leucine. Why wouldn't you like <laughs> HMB? If, if they basically do the same thing, why is it the, the argument is always framed as HMB sucks, but leucine is great when in fact, I do the same thing. <laughs> uh, it's just weird. I remember HMB, boy, that, that brings back memories. I took that stuff for a little while. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was like DECA. <laughs> yeah <laughs> just like it <laughs> just like deca oh amazing my God. you know it's interesting um when you mentioned hmb now back then i don't i think hmb is a little bit more of a comeback i did see in some article i think muscular development is one of the few magazines now that continues to do one of the few magazines actually shows a lot of studies because weeder used to do the same thing but now muscular development or muscle and fitness used to be I think they're coming back too. Well, HMB does have a role. Yeah, what's HMB's role? It is coming it, back. Um, it's not useful for you know typically typically your young, healthy male or female who who weight trains. It's not going to help. It'll help two groups: people who are starting out, so the novice trainer, but more importantly, it helps the elderly. There is data showing that if you if you uh, supplement uh, the elderly. So let's say people over 65, 70 years of age, HMB helps. So again, when you look through, when you're looking through a prism of 18 to 35 year old bodybuilders, it's like, okay, well, it's kind of, it's useless, right? It's useless. But if you're looking at 65 to 75 year olds, it's actually quite useful. So again, context matters. And uh, a lot of people sort of lose context when it comes to HMB as well. Same, same with branched chain amino acids. 
I guess we'll move over to the next big dog. And this one seems to be pretty solid from everything I've seen, but I just want to get confirmation, I guess, from you, or maybe a disagreement. Uh, creatine. That seems to be still pretty solid. There is no single supplement that is as safe and as effective as creatine. Nothing. In fact, creatine does so many good things that it's, it's even amazing to scientists who study it. Um, like for instance, if you go back when it was first uh, introduced into the market, early nineties, you know, everyone was surprised that a supplement increased lean body mass and improved performance. It's like, wow, that's kind of cool. And then study after study after study confirmed that. So at this point, when you're dealing with exercise performance issues, to be honest, we're kind of bored with it. As scientists, we're like, okay, we know it helps. There's like <laughs> over a hundred studies. So what's interesting is the research has shifted to more clinical things. In fact, we finished the study last year, had it published showing that creatine helps brain function. So we've gone from the realm of exercise performance to now cognitive performance where creatine helps brain function. There's data showing that creatine decreases uh, the side effects of a traumatic brain injury. So if you get a concussion, you get punched in the head or you get in a motor vehicle accident, creatine can help. Also there's data to show that creatine can help um, various neuromuscular diseases. Um, Creatine helps those who are sleep deprived. Creatine helps uh, type two diabetics. Um, wow. Creatine acts as an, yeah, creatine and not only helps strength power athletes, but can help endurance athletes. It's gotten to the point where it's like, wow, creatine seems to do a little bit of everything from a health standpoint to a performance standpoint. And it's, I always say is, you know, if there's one supplement everyone should take, and I mean, literally mean everyone. My, my, when my kids were young, they played travel softball. We gave them creatine. Um, I think everyone should take creatine. Even if you don't care about the bodybuilding stuff, the gain in lean mass, take it for your brain. It, it, it helps brain function. Do and you know fact, how I did that by chance? Or that's my no area. Knows. So I'm like, curious. I'll yeah, because the brain... Well, the exercise scientists have an easier time studying skeletal muscle because you could always take a biopsy. But unfortunately, yeah. you can't biopsy the brain. You know, yeah, so that, we're that really legally. dealing, <laughs> yeah, really, you know, maybe in China, they can do that. Um, <laughs> but um, we're only, when you measure the end effect, the end result of supplementation, uh, for instance, creatine helps uh, improve memory, but here's the interesting, it helps improve memory the most in vegetarians and vegans. Why? Because there's no creatine in their diet. To get creatine, you got to eat meats or fish. In fact, fish has the highest concentration. So if you're not eating any meat or fish, your brain is quite deficient in creatine. And once you start supplementing, you're like, well, my memory's better. Um, Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so for all my vegan and vegetarian friends out there, you know what? I know you're not going to eat a steak with me, but can you buy a bottle of creatine? <laughs> Take it for Christ's sake. <laughs> well, that's been the big push for 20 years now, really kind of an anti-beef a mantra for years i think it's coming back now because of well a lot of divide division in the country but there's one particular group that's really big on eating beef and it's kind of being pushed again and i think it was a new book that came out i read a couple of years ago we had her on the show where nina teicholz and she wrote a book on saturated fat really that bad for you and that was fascinating too talking about that yeah oh. hmm. saturate yeah Sorry to digress, but when you oh. mentioned saturated fat, because I get asked this question, I teach a sports nutrition course at, um, at the university, at Nova Southeastern University, and yeah. invariably you get questions of, hey, saturated fat, fat bad, is sugar bad, blah, blah, blah. Saturated fat, okay. <clears throat> saturated fat, most of our intake either comes from meats, maybe if you drink milk, if you use butter, whatever. And the answer to that is... <clears throat> Again, it, a lot of it is the context. I tell people who, who sits around and eats saturated fat. I mean, do you do you go to do you go to uh, you know Applebee's or whatever crappy restaurant down the street? Hey, can I have an order of saturated fat, please? <laughs> Nobody does that. So because we, you know, I I tell you, we eat mixed meals. So if you're ordering a steak which has saturated fat, but also having salad with vinegar dressing which isn't saturated fat with maybe a complex carb like brown rice or whatever you like, white rice mm -hmm. or bread, you're eating a mixed meal. You're not eating saturated fat. So within the scheme of everything you do, okay, let's say saturated fat increases LDL levels, which, you know, increases your cardiovascular risk, theoretically, right? Okay. You also exercise. 
You also are, are of normal weight. Your blood pressure is normal. All these things you do, in fact, exercise would be the single most important thing. All these things you do decrease your risk factors. Does it really freaking matter if you're putting butter on your bread? No. I mean, my answer is no. It doesn't matter. Don't obsess over this stuff because nobody sits down and eats saturated fat. Same with sugar, although it might be different with sugar because some people do sit down and literally eat sugar. It's just, you know, in the form of a cookie or whatever. But no one sits down and eats saturated fat. It's you it's the idea of, this is why nutrition science is so confusing. It's the idea that we can isolate these things and say, hey, saturated fat's going to kill you uh, because, you know, we have these observational studies showing that people tend to eat a lot of saturated fat also tend to do this. Well, as individuals, we don't, <laughs> I always say, as individuals, the average doesn't predict what you, you do individually. So even, even if in the aggregate, saturated fat does that, but if you're also exercising, and also of normal weight and also normal blood, blood pressure, does it really matter? So in the scheme of things, you have to you sort of look at all these risk factors and ask yourself, does it really matter? Because you're, you know, it, it would be different if you're overweight, sedentary, a smoker. Oh, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> maybe you should watch what you eat because all the other stuff in context. That's a great, great comic. I know as I speak with, with uh, professors in genetics, it's kind of moved that way in the direction as well. It's because people, I think it's really the media. I hate to say it, but it's the news media. They, they really make everything seem simple when it isn't. Yes. <laughs> there's a lot of relationships and everything, even the genes. It isn't one particular gene. It's going to be gene interacting with the environment. And the same thing here with relationship with foods. Like you said, it was beautifully said. It depends on the individual. If you're sitting there every day eating McDonald's and whatnot, that's a whole different ballgame. And if you're sedentary and if you're stressed out. Yep. Yeah. Very different ballgame. That's a great point. Yeah. I mean, humans are, you know, humans are complex machines. And to try to use a single variable to make a prediction about something, you know, it, it, just doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, like I have a friend who uh, his cholesterol is, and this is what's funny about cholesterol. When I was at, when I was in college, it, uh, I think a high cholesterol might have been two hundred twenty total cholesterol, and then they dropped it to two hundred, which I was like, well, that's kind of weird. So, but I think even now two hundred is high now. <laughs> yeah, and so they keep dropping it, which means the threshold for taking a drug for it is easier mm -hmm. to reach. But anyways, you know. Uh, the physician said something to the effect of, well, maybe I should put you on a statin to lower your cholesterol. And he asked me and I said, why would you go on a statin? You don't smoke, normal blood pressure, you work out, <laughs> normal body weight. Why the hell would you go on a statin? Well, cause you said my cholesterol's high. I'm like, it's one variable out of many variables. So, and that's the problem in a way that's the problem with medicine, like Western medicine is they look at one variable. They're like, whoa, that's high. We need to lower it. Uh, doc, but all the other stuff is normal. So why should I take a drug to lower something when everything else is fine? Because at the end of the day, and I don't know what you're feeling on this, but I feel like Americans, a lot of Americans, <laughs> have lost just the basic concept of risk assessment, like our risk reward. I mean, this is the risk. This is the reward. Should you take a drug knowing the side effects of the drug, you know, lowering your cholesterol? even though everything else is fine, should you? And, and I would say it's an individual decision. If you want to take it, take a stat and take a stat. I don't really care. But at the end of the day, I think it's a dumb, it's a dumb decision. It's sort of like um, surgery. Should you get surgery for chronic low back pain? Well, the first thing I would ask is, have you, what's your weight? Have you tried to lose weight? Uh, do you exercise? Have you tried to do everything non-surgically possible? And until the answer to that is yes, then it's like, no, don't do surgery. So... And I have these kinds of conversations with friends all the time about, you know, should I use this antibiotic? Should I go, you know, uh, get a hip replacement surgeon? It's like, it's not just a simple yes, no answer. It's, you know, what else are you doing? Uh, so, so you're so true. You're so right. Because it's society, there's a lot of people who don't understand research. They don't understand probability and statistics. And mm -hmm. it's, it's sad because I think a lot of the news exploits it. Either they're incompetent yep. in how it works or they're just exploiting it, knowing that this is going to trigger people because it works even in the supplement industry. You know, oh, L-carnitine, which is my next one in a minute, but L-carnitine, that's going to be fat loss. 
<laughs> it's like, really? That one thing is going to be fat loss. I've only seen one, a couple of them that really worked that strongly. And one was clenbuterol, which you probably are familiar with. The drug. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I've seen ephedra when it was available years ago. <laughs> when that one was of my legal. favorites. <laughs> that sucker was powerful. But yep. carnitine, well, what's your take on that? <laughs> I can assure you it's not going to help you lose fat. Oh, come on. <laughs> Ruining my day. That's what, in <laughs> fact, that's a supplement I can tell you based on whatever data there is, you're not going to lose fat if all you did was take L carnitine. Now, I have noticed that actually, I don't know anyone who takes L carnitine now that I think about it, but the marketing behind it is take it and also go work out. <laughs> well, no, go work out. Well, I, I think that part helps, <laughs> but the L, L carnitine, no, no, nothing. That's a great point, too. A lot of supplements are always with the condition of that you work out and eat well. What the hell are you? <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> exactly. I know they're trying to maximize it, but that's really a hard one to, to max it, to figure out. Um, mm -hmm. Way too many confounding variables. On that. <laughs> um, OK, so we got that. So L-carnitine, folks, you know, if it makes it feel better, placebo effect, maybe. I don't know. Um, True. Yeah. yeah, that could play a role, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> There's another one that used to be really big for a while, and then it fizzled out. I don't know if VAS actually played around with this one or not. I don't remember seeing it. But chromium picolinate, and then they had chromium polynicotate. <laughs> wow, that was uh, the original data uh, was a researcher out in, I want to say Washington State, last name was Bria or Brilla, B-R-I-L-L-A, I believe, showing that it helped with fat loss, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the beauty of science is that when other people try to repeat it, they should get the same results, right? Well, yeah. no one's been able to repeat it. So at this point, chromium picolinate or whatever form of chromium, there's not, it's not going to impact body composition. It's just not. Um, so it doesn't help with insulin and pushing sugar. Uh, nothing. Well, you, if you're type two diabetic. Uh, so within that context, yeah, but within people who are normally healthy, it's not going to, it's not going to do anything. I got the other thing. All right. So chromium's out, folks. Next. <laughs> We're saving your money right now. We're saving your money. Um, the other one, Doc, would be uh, glutamine. That's another one that really hit the market for a while, got really big. And then it seems to be kind of fizzling <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. The, the only data on glutamine where, in a very narrow sense, it might be helpful is. If you do extreme exercise, glutamine might lessen your chances of getting an upper respiratory tract infection. And this is based on data from people who ran a marathon, so 26.2 miles, and had and received uh, glutamine or were in a control group. And people who took glutamine suffered less from less uh, lower incidence of, of URTI, upper respiratory tract infections. But again, what's the context? you got to do something pretty extreme. It's not like you're going to the gym for an hour and lifting. That's not extreme. Running 5K, that is not extreme. Maybe running 26 miles is extreme. So, <laughs> so if you're doing something extreme, it might actually help. Interesting. This one's kind of fascinating to me. I think we're, we're on the same page on this kind of issue with um, lobbying. <laughs> but it's interesting because multivitamins were big for many, many years. And then there's a small group that started coming out against multivitamins. If you just ate right, you don't need them. What's your take on that? Um, I take a multivitamin maybe two or three times a week. Um, to me, I use it, it. To me, it's my personal insurance policy in terms of getting, hmm. uh, you know, vitamins and minerals. Um, do you know the question? You know, people ask, do I need it? Well, it's an interesting question because technically, I don't need any of this. I don't need any of the stuff I take. So whether or not I need it is really the wrong question. The question is, will it help me? And the answer to that is, I don't know, but I know that if I don't take it, maybe it'll hurt me. So it's one of those things where I'm just trying to <laughs> maintain a certain level because, you know, can I, do I tell, can I tell difference if I don't take multivitamins? Uh, probably not, but here's the thing. I don't know about you, but my diet tends to be very repetitive every day. I, I don't, I don't eat a lot of different foods for the morning. I'll have a protein shake for lunch. I might have a sandwich and chips. Yeah, I like potato chips. And for dinner, I almost have, almost always have the same thing. I have rice with meat, with vegetables. So I'm thinking, am I getting all the vitamins and minerals eating 
pretty much the same way all the time on weekends, you know, we go out restaurants and stuff, but you know, and to me, and, and I, I'm not going to do a deep analysis of my diet to figure it out. I'm like, yeah, screw it. I'll just take a multivitamin just to cover my bases in case I'm deficient. So, but most people who, who train tend to repeat the same, you know, consuming the same food. So to me, will a multivitamin hurt? No. Can it possibly help? Eh, maybe. At worst, it does nothing, you know? So I take one a couple of times, three times a week. Yeah, I should mention the only thing I've noticed is calcium. If I take a supplementation of calcium, I'll see my nails grow faster. That one <laughs> really? I have, yeah, that one I have noticed. I have to cut my wow. fingernails. If I started taking that about, I have to cut my fingernails once every seven days or so. If I don't, it stays a little longer than that. It's been weird. Yeah, I've never taken, yeah, I've never taken calcium. That's interesting. Uh, but I do, I mean, I, I do have one cup of milk a day just because I use milk to take my vitamins and mineral and, you know, supplements in the morning, but you have never actually supplemented with calcium. You know, what's interesting about calcium is uh, there was work by a gentleman, I think his name is Zemel, uh, Z-E-M-E-L. This is going back ways where he looked at, there was a relationship between calcium intake, dairy intake, and adiposity, meaning those who were low in intake tended to be fatter. Although finding a cause and effect, meaning if I suddenly give people milk and calcium, will they lose fat? No. So a lot of it is an association type effect uh, or an, an association. Um, I don't, I mean, in the scheme of things, if you're thinking calcium or dairy might help you lose fat, I think you're barking up the wrong tree, but there's that data. That's interesting. It's so funny that I was talking to another, uh, well, he was, he's a personal trainer, but it was interesting. We were talking about how funny society is they're attacking beef they'll attack tuna because of mercury they attack eggs because of cholesterol they attack milk but they won't attack the processed foods <laughs> <laughs> and they won't bother much with mcdonald's or anything else maybe they feel like everybody already knows it's bad i don't know but it's like they're attacking the, the main foods <laughs> foods yeah right. foods, it's they're attacking literally foods that are like staples around the world <laughs> And whether you like bodybuilders or not, or you're a CrossFitter, that's what they tend to eat. <laughs> that's <laughs> all this food. And they're like, they're yeah. the creatures out there. It's, it's amazing. You know, that gets me another question, which is kind of weird. I've seen this kind of weird thing. I don't know how long it's been going on, but some people against fruits because of the sugar. Because <laughs> of the sugar. Yeah. What's up with that one? I mean, I think it's <laughs> silly. Um, here, here's the confession. I actually, I don't. I don't know the last time I ate a fruit. I'm not a fruit eater. I eat vegetables a lot, but I don't eat fruit. And so, you know, you're supposed to get, you know, whatever, three to five servings of fruit a day. I'm like, heck, I'm lucky if I get that a month. Hell, two months. Uh, you know, I might eat one banana every three months. I'm like, yeah, I think I want a banana today. Um, but again, it's it's part of vilifying sugar or carbs. You know, you could almost just blanket, blanket cover it with just using the term carbohydrate, you know. The idea that carbohydrate, excess carbohydrate intake is the primary culprit when it comes to obesity. Um, but yeah, I don't know anyone who's gotten fat eating bananas and strawberries and cherries. If anything, you might just get sick before you eat too much of it because, you know, it's, it's, it's too filling. But yeah, that's, it's silly. Um, it's absolutely silly. This is another interesting one. I've, I've heard different stories on this. We're going to get maybe a little more technical. I don't know, but water. We obviously, water is really important. Yeah, I know. It's kind of weird, but trust me, I'm getting there. <laughs> well, I have a friend of mine. She drinks water. She hates water. I don't know how you hate water, but she hates water. But she drinks <laughs> flavored water. Now, the argument goes, okay. if you drink flavored water, you've changed the chemical structure of the water. So being able to attract other, we're getting into chemistry, but attracting other things to be able to purify your body and eliminating them to the kidneys may not work as well, well because you change the composition chemically of the water. I don't know. So I guess my take is flavored water versus water doesn't make a difference. Uh, because it doesn't. <laughs> I, I'm trying to, where would someone get the idea that you would change the chemical composition of water by flavoring it? I mean, they read, they, either a friend told him, you know, uh, or they read it somewhere, but it's such a, <laughs> it's such a <laughs> stupid idea. <laughs> Where do people come up with this crap? How about if you add sugar to it? Would it ruin it? Obviously, right? <laughs> you be well, you're adding, yeah. 
now you're adding calories. So you might need the sugar if you're exercising. <laughs> this is an interesting one. I read a study. I think it was a study. It was either a study or somebody's opinion. <laughs> so I'll use it as opinion <laughs> to be safe. Um, somebody had mentioned that Gatorade was one of the best ones. Actually, I think it was a sports nutrition book, I think. Um, to mention Gatorade was actually pretty good for replenishing electrolytes and after workout. Do you, what do you think? Can't remember that one. Well, they're, they're actually data compare, uh, comparing uh, water uh, to Gatorade uh, to milk. The best hydrate, the best thing for hydration of those three is milk, oddly enough, which is kind really? of surprising. I was surprised. Yeah, Gatorade is really better than water. Why? Because you're replacing sodium and some potassium, which you lose. Um, I work with a few, uh, uh, competitive do athletes. So in, in these races, it, it's run, bike, run. So you run like a mile, you bike, whatever, whatever the distance is 10 to 12 miles, then you run, you know, 5k or 10k. And part of the supplementation is I teach them to teach themselves how to consume 30 to 60 grams of carbs per hour during a race. Now you don't do it during a race. First, you do it during training so that you're used to it because a lot of people aren't used to consuming, you know, carbohydrate during training. So there is a role for Gatorade, which is much better than water. If the goal is performance, obviously most people can't perform, so it doesn't matter. But if the goal is performance and you're trying to win or at least win place or show, a sports drink with sugar and sodium and potassium is better than water. Water is not... You know, people say, well, you ought to drink water. Well, yeah, water is great, but it's not, it's actually not the best thing. I mean, if you want to perform, people forget that the three of the most effective ergogenic aids, things that help performance are water with sugar, with caffeine, water, sugar, caffeine, water, sugar, caffeine. Ba people, it's basic stuff, but people forget that stuff helps. I mean, water alone is not as good as water with sugar. And water alone is not as good as water with carbs with caffeine. So, um, yes, so that, plenty of data on, on certainly on carbohydrate supplementation during training and racing, as well as the caffeine. We got about 10 minutes, folks. So you want to hang out now because I'm going to ask Dr. Antonio what he thinks are the best supplements. <laughs> we threw a lot out there at him. Uh, so we'll look at muscle building. We'll look at the cutting fat loss. And we'll also look at the sports performance. Which ones would he recommend for these three categories? So doc, what do you, what would you recommend? We'll start off with muscle building for people who just want to build muscle. Okay. Muscle building. The two, the two you must do would be a, a supplemental protein because it's hard to get enough protein if all you did was eat. In fact, one of my good friends who's a scientist and a bodybuilder says he couldn't get enough protein if it was through meals, it, it would be tiring to eat. So he has to supplement with protein anywhere from 40 to 80 grams uh, as a shake. So that's number one. Number two, you have to take creatine. Uh, the dosing should be at least five grams a day. Those two supplements alone will increase lean body mass. So make sure you get those two. What about water retention off of creatine? Is that still an issue? I think I used to hear that. Well, well what's interesting about, it's very individual. I know some people who complain they feel bloated, but there is value to increase water in your body, particularly if it's in your cells because it acts as an anabolic signal. So creatine is, you know, opposite of what people think. It's actually a hydrating agent, not a dehydrating agent. So there is value to it. Now, for, uh, for people who compete in a sport, like a weight class sport, they got to make, make, make a weight class. Sometimes that water retention is detrimental because they don't want to be in a higher weight class. So let's say before a fight, because, you know, the mixed martial arts, you got to uh, hit a weight class, just go off to creatine mm. for maybe three or four weeks before, and you'll be fine. What about fat loss? We've lost the Fedra. <laughs> Chromium's out. l carnitine has <clears throat> gone. I'm, I'm assuming C, what is the CLA is probably no good either. Um, correct. You're correct on all counts. <laughs> is there well, anything here's left? the thing. Honestly, I told, I told my class, the one supplement that worked really well, caffeine and ephedra, the FDA banned, and it worked. <laughs> It worked. And, work well. and here's the thing. the F, I hate to say it, but the FDA is full of shit. They, I think they were basing on these adverse events of people taking caffeine and ephedra. And I think there were three, I'd have to look it up, but I, there was three deaths associated with it. And even yeah. when you look at those three deaths, it, it wasn't a cause and effect. There were other things going on, like severe dehydration, you know, and other things. But it worked. 
It, you, you know, it's funny. It worked better than any pharmaceutical brand product or drug. Um, and they banned it. It's like the, it was like the dumbest thing ever. Just dumb. Because there's other things they don't ban that should be banned <laughs> that they've kept. <laughs> No, I, I agree. That that one, I remember those days. I forgot what it was called. It used to be a drink. Um, it had the Fedra in there, the Ma Wong. Oh, shoot. Uh, orange? No. Uh, Rip Fuel or was, something. Rip Fuel was one. Was that the Dan Duchesne product? It was a green drink. Uh, I remember I, I used remember. to pop those things like, no, there was no tomorrow. But that sucker, you're right. I mean, it dropped. Carlos, you know, that was like thir- that was like 30 years ago for us. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm calling it a time warp, it seems like. Um, okay, so fat loss pretty much watch out for your macros. <laughs> and maybe watch what you eat, man. How about calorie cycling diet? Is that you like that one by chance for, for fat loss? The when you say calorie diet? cycling, you're talking about manipulating total calories, you know. I'm uh, yeah, yes, used to do it. He, he big Phillips was a big proponent of it. Remember, it was like eating really healthy for five or six days, and then you have a cheat day because to shock your body, and then you come back for five or six days. And I think they did studies in Sweden for like you can do it 14 days of eating poorly and 14 days of eating well, and <laughs> things like, like that. Yeah, well, even with any of those diets, at the end of the day, it's still I hate to say it, it's still a um, if the goal is to lose weight, it's still a, a caloric deficit. Um and to me, a better method, because I've done this research, you know, I've done all these high protein diet studies, huh. is just jack your protein intake up. And if you jack your protein intake up, and it can be just through shakes, you're more apt to lose body fat. And maybe it's because all that protein blunts your appetite, as well as the, the thermo- thermogenic effect of protein. So to me, that's better than, you know, the whole idea of calorie cycling, I think, is to improve adherence to a diet. So if you know you get to eat, crappy food for two days straight, but you have to eat perfectly for five days. It's like, okay, it's kind of the reward, you know, it's sort of that carrot and stick. So here's my reward, even though I, you know, I don't want to eat, you know, let's use the word term clean. If you're eating clean for five days in a row, and then you get eat like crap on weekends. Some people use that as a reward. Whereas, you know, my attitude is, can you, can you even sustain that? Are you going to do that for the next 10 years? So if you can't, then why even start? It's sort of like exercise. You know, when people say, hey, what exercise should I do? It's like, well, whatever you can stick, stick to. And they're like, well, what's the best exercise? Well, there is no best exercise because it really depends what your goal is. Same with diet. It's, you know, it, if it's not sustainable, it's really almost not worth trying um, if you can't stick to it. That's a great point. Great point. I guess, uh, how about for athletes? Uh, this is complicated. because you know, We have to bring it back. We really have to bring it back, Doc. I think it'd be so much fun. But for athletes, there's a lot of different variations, right? As you mentioned earlier, there's runners, there's swimmers, there's MMA. Yeah. There's... So I'm going to stick with MMA because of the audience I have um, for fighters who are going to do these kind of explosive short-term types of things for four or five minutes. Um, what do you think for them? Is there anything you would recommend? Well, definitely the protein, maybe the creatine, depending on what weight class they're in. But there is one that I think absolutely all MMA fighters boxers wrestlers should take and that's beta alanine beta alanine is a non-essential amino acid that when you consume it it combines with an amino acid in your body called histidine so when beta alanine combines with histidine it forms a compound called carnosine not not to be confused with carnitine so carnosine when it's in your skeletal muscle it acts as a buffer so anytime you're training hard and you're producing a lot of lactate and when you produce a lot of lactate you're also increasing the acidity of skeletal muscle. And if it becomes very acidic, it impairs performance. But when you take beta alanine, you're able to maintain that workload without fatiguing as quickly. <clears throat> so I think beta alanine, in fact, for some of the lower weight classes, a lot of them won't even take any creatine because they're afraid it'll bump their weight up. So take beta alanine. It's one of the best performance aids out there. Now there's another one you know, if we're talking about MMA would be the nitrates or beetroot juice because of its effect on increasing blood flow. Uh, there's plenty of data on that. So the nitrates and beta alanine, I think are, are an absolute must. Great stuff. It kind of reminds me of that. There's a new one I saw the other day. It looks like it's a new one. I don't know, you know how they focus on one and then it comes out of style and now it's in vogue. I think it's L-sutrulene. Oh, L-citrulline. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of a similar mechanism um, as the nitrates in that it might uh, okay. have an effect on blood flow. That, you know, that's also worth taking because, you oh. know, there's no 
there's no harm to it. Could it possibly help? Yeah. So uh, L-citrulline is another one, actually. That's a good, that's a good one. Glad you brought that up. Yeah, that was, uh, I got lucky. Because <laughs> everything else I got shot down. <laughs> Um, <laughs> fascinating stuff. Well, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Antonio. Uh, where can we get more information about you and what you're up to? Yeah, the best place is um, my academic nonprofit that I run, the International Society of Sports Nutrition. The website is issn.net. That's issn.net. Also, uh, we have a Facebook page, the International Society of Sports Nutrition, as well as an Instagram page. Um, it is the underscore ISSN. That is T H E underscore ISSN. Th that, those would be the best places to get information. And so, hey, if you have nothing to do, Carlos, June 16 to 18th, yeah. Fort Lauderdale Beach, 19th annual meeting. Um, I would highly recommend it. I think you'd have a lot of fun. Um, basically, like our blast. conversation, yeah, our conversation would be one that you could repeat like 100 times just talking to random people there. It's, 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 it's really, it's really a lot of fun. I mean, you'll have a lot of PhDs, MDs, a lot of students, a lot of dietitians, and actually most of the people who attend are personal trainers. So it's not, people think it's just a bunch of science nerds. It's like, well, no, actually it's mostly trainers. You're maybe 20% science nerds. Yeah. So it's a good crowd. That's really good. Especially, I think that's one of the few fields left that doesn't get certified or not, but well, they get certified, but it doesn't have to be, there's no licensing for them. So it becomes kind of a there's wild no licensing. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of licensure. I think it's, it's silly, but Hey, that's just, me neither. The only issue is you have a lot of, uh, what would you say? Uh, wild elements. <laughs> they're going out, they're doing training. They read a couple well, magazines and all of a sudden, well, you know, know. It's, it's, it's What'd funny you, you say that. Um, because yeah, I have this conversation about licensure all the time, particularly as it applies to nutrition advice. Oh. And I always say, I take a very free market approach. I'm like, okay, let's say you, not you personally, but you know, you, the hypothetical you in the audience, let's say you have a degree. Let's say you have a master's degree in nutrition, or maybe you're even a dietitian or whatever. Okay. You're king shit. You know, all this stuff. If you can't outcompete the bodybuilder in the gym, who barely got out of high school, that's your problem. It's not their problem. It's your problem. <laughs> if you can't, you know, at the end of the day, a consumer will choose who they're comfortable with, you know, and then you hear the argument, well, it's for the safety of consumers. You know, we want them to be safe. I'm like, <laughs> first that's of all, a good point. licensure is not for the safety of consumer. Licensure is to protect the profession. The reason, like, for instance, why do massage therapists have, have to have a license? Can, can somebody explain that to me? I mean, I go, you know, when I get a massager, it's like, why do you need a license for this? Why, kids, well, well, can't you teach important. someone? <laughs> so, I mean, there's all these things that are licensed. I'm like, why is there a license for this? Why do I need a license to sell insurance? I mean, it's anyways, I mean, that's a different tangent here. We're talking about economics now, but uh, well, that's a, that's a I think point, at the though. end of the day, if a PhD can't provide better information than someone with a bachelor's degree, that sucks. That, that's the PhD's fault. It's like, you, you say you know all this stuff, well, then prove it. I mean, don't walk around like, and this annoys the shit out of me. You know, people with advanced degrees is like, oh, I have an MD, I have a PhD, I know everything. It's like, <laughs> well, if you knew everything, why are they going to that other person? <laughs> you know, so, convince the general public, convince the consumer that you're worth it. And no one gives a shit about your title anyway, so. Yeah, and a lot of times people just don't believe it anyway. <laughs> exactly. It's, exactly. It's, it's a weird world we live in. Well, there, folks, I think we're <laughs> going to leave it at that. But fascinating conversation. Jose Antonio, go check out International Society of Sports Nutrition. International Society of Sports Nutrition. Check it out. Hey, if you're there in June, you might see me there. I'm definitely hey. going to make it out there. So make sure you share, subscribe, hit that like button. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks.